Have you ever thought about technologies that, were they invented today, would just be laughed at? Stairs are like that, I think. A big hole in the floor that you just need to not fall down, without even a safety railing in front of it? There is no way building codes would allow that if it wasn't already such an established idea. Or gasoline is a general purpose energy storage. A flammable, explosive, toxic material that anyone can just go buy in volume and splash around however they want? It's kind of ridiculous, actually, when you think about it. And keyboards. Imagine needing to put data into a computer and deciding that the solution was a special peripheral with 104 buttons on it, and that everyone just needed to practice with this thing until they could operate it at the rate of many dozens of key presses a minute. Not specialists. Everyone. There's something charmingly naive about the whole concept. Anyway, I've been using this 1990 Model M keyboard for decades, ever since I dug it out of the massive keyboard bin at the old Boeing Surplus retail store. I haven't felt much of a desire to get into the modern mechanical keyboard scene as a result. Why mess with perfection? It would need to be something very special indeed to get me to take the leap. So that conversation with my manager that led to the pocket typewriter see previous video? When he started to describe that, my brain immediately jumped to the idea of a keyboard based on old letterpress type cases. Typesetting even just a page of text needs a whole bunch of type, and each one needs a place to live. Type cases solve that problem by presenting a bunch of shallow compartments, one for each character you might want to type. Traditionally, majuscule characters went up here, and minuscule down here. You might know those better as uppercase and lowercase. These are, in fact, the cases in question. With industrialization in the 19th century, plus growing literacy and thus demand for reading materials, these type cases became more standardized. One particularly popular option was the California case, and then the slightly smaller version, the two-thirds California case. So the obvious question is, why not turn it into a keyboard? I mean, other than the fact that this would be a lengthy and expensive process to make something of negative practical utility. Other than that, why not? It started with a circuit. Most keyboards use a switch matrix, and so does mine. Basically, there are far too many keys, in to hook each one up to a separate I.O. line on a microcontroller. Instead, arrange the switches into a grid. Each column and each row is hooked up to its own I.O. line, needing only, in the best case scenario, two square root of n lines. In a tight loop, have the microcontroller test each row to see if it is connected to each column. If it is, that key is being pressed. Easy. It's a bit more complicated in practice. Like hooking up any switch to a microcontroller, you need to add pull-up or pull-down resistors to make sure you get a defined result when the switch is open. In this case, I was using a Teensy, so I could rely on its built-in pull-up resistors. It also gets more complicated when you consider what happens when multiple keys are pushed at the same time. If it's just, say, these two, it still works fine. The microcontroller can tell that each is pushed correctly as it scans. But what if this third switch is pushed as well? Now, as the scan comes through, it detects all four of these switches as being pushed, because they're all electrically connected. This is called a ghost key effect, and something needs to be done to stop it from happening. Luckily, there is an easy answer. Add a diode to each switch. These act as check valves, allowing current to flow in one direction, but not the other. Now when these three switches are pushed, the microcontroller won't see the ghost key, because the current can't flow backwards into the other switches. And that's it. It's a big circuit, but not a complicated one. It ended up being 144 switches in a matrix of 9 rows and 16 columns. The matrix layout could have been done more efficiently, but I had enough I.O. lines not to worry about it. Next up, making a PCB. Yes, you could just manually wire a matrix directly onto the switches, and it works fine. But I really love the elegance of a printed circuit board. Plus, I'd never had a PCB this big fab, so it seemed like a fun opportunity. Switches on the front, and surface mount diodes on the back. These could have been through hole easily enough, but I got a lot of practice with SMD during my Eurorack phase, and I do love how tiny they are. They're so cute. Another thing I had never done with a PCB is try my hand at silkscreen art. They've all been fairly utilitarian before, but a project like this deserves better. 
Since I'm still on a Penrose tiling kick after my art installation this summer, I wanted to do a gradient of one that fades out towards the top of the board. Turns out doing halftone dots in Inkscape is actually pretty easy. And then I used the SVG to Sinjin plugin to get it into a format that KiCad can handle. That's the same process I used for adding logos and version numbers to my boards anyway, so it was easy enough. Speaking of, I figured this board would need a bit of context for future archaeologists. So that's the brains of the thing. What about the body? I could have machined something, but I'd like the idea of a wood case being more true to the source inspiration. I exported the user.eco1 layer from KiCad, which the switch footprints helpfully included to show where the holes need to be cut for plate-mounted switches. With this in Inkscape, I could design a stack of laser-cut sheets around it. One thin aluminum for the switch plate, the rest in bamboo plywood. By stacking three layers of the 3 16th inch plywood, I'd get pretty much the perfect offset for the board with 2mm spacers under it. I actually ordered a small test plate and PCB first, to make sure all the dimensions were good. This was going to be pricey enough, I wanted to get it right the first try. This also gave me a nice little test bed when thinking about the last big problem. Keycaps. These are the heart of the mechanical keyboard world. Keycaps are separate from switches, allowing a huge amount of customization. And there are dozens of switch types to choose from as well, of course. There are some really amazing keycap sets available, which I've always admired. Though the vast majority are always out of stock, it seems. But, unfortunately, I wouldn't be able to take advantage of this resource anyway. See, the two-thirds is a very silly keyboard. Because, obviously, the original two-third cases weren't designed to be keyboards. They were designed to hold type. And the thing about type is that you don't need the same number of each kind. You need a whole lot more E's than you do K's. So the compartments are sized accordingly, being roughly in proportion to the frequency of use in the English language for that character. The layout is also informed by this. Notice how all the big compartments are towards the center, keeping them in easy reach for faster, more efficient typesetting. And yes, efficiency in typesetting was a very big deal. You only have to stare, slack-jawed, at the overwhelming mechanical complexity of a linotype machine to be convinced of that. What that meant for my keyboard is that I needed a lot of 2x2 unit keycaps, and one 2x3 keycap for the lowercase e. This is a problem because keyboard hardware isn't designed for that. Long keys, like shift and space, have metal rods under them that let them operate using a single switch without binding. These are called stabilizers, or stabs if you're trying to sound a bit too cool, and they're a standard part of a mechanical keyboard. But there isn't an equivalent system for stabilizing keys that are tall and wide. You do occasionally see 2x2 two two keycaps in point-of-sale systems, and I've heard rumors of a 2x3. I believe these just work by pushing down on multiple switches, which isn't supposed to be the best feel for typing. I got these 2x2 two two caps for testing, and they worked okay. Each of my larger keys would have a switch at each corner, and that would have to be good enough. But no one printing custom keycap sets includes 2x2 keycaps as an option, much less 2x3. The only commercially available option I could find were those 2x2 caps that let you insert a slip of paper to label them for a point-of-sale system. Pretty ugly, and it didn't solve the 2x3 problem anyway. I wasn't going to be able to buy my keycaps. That left 3D printing as the only option. I found some models on Shapeways and had a couple printed as a test. And they worked, though the texture wasn't exactly amazing. But each one cost about $10. A rough estimate of the total cost for the full set was quickly approaching a grand. Now, I like a good quixotic project as much as the next crazed YouTube maker. But even if I could find a good bulk discount, I couldn't spend anywhere near that amount. So I thought about it. I've never had a 3D printer myself because, well... I'm a material snob. That's why I got into machining. I don't like holding plastic, and extrusion printed plastic even less so. I was happy to outsource the occasional job to Shapeways and focus on building a shop where I could build things using proper materials. Metal. But over the last few years, I've been getting curious about resin SLA printers. The results looked pretty nice, actually, for plastic. And the speed of printing was impressive too, since they expose an entire layer at once. Having print time scale by the maximum height instead of volume is impressive. 
so it occurred to me that a printer had to be less than what I was looking at in printing costs, and then I'd have a printer and experience at the end of the process. And yeah, it was cheaper. Way cheaper. I picked up this Anycubic Photon M3 for under $300. When did they get so cheap? It arrived and I started printing. And printing, and printing. I needed 86 keys and the success rate started out fairly low. But I got better over time, learning the intricacies of support placement and FEP cleaning and platen leveling and everything else. Eventually I got kicked out of the dining room and set up out in the garage. I also switched to the Chidu Box app for doing the supports and slicing, and I found its output printed a lot more reliably without having to go in and add a million extra supports manually. Let's talk about key layout. I wanted it to be as faithful as possible to the original two-thirds, but it still needed to be at least somewhat functional as a keyboard, which meant a lot of keys for things like Enter, Control, Alt, Escape, etc. Luckily, the original layout had some blanks, and some compartments that wouldn't be relevant anyway. A lot of typesetting is stacking up spacers of various thicknesses to make each row the exact same width, because they need to be clamped very tightly into the chase for printing. I'd need a space key, but not different size spaces. So all these were free to be repurposed. I also didn't need all these ligatures. These are a combination of characters that, traditionally, get merged together into a single piece of type if they come up next to each other in the text being typeset, to make the result prettier and easier to read. You may have noticed that keyboards don't have these, and that's because that's the job of the word processor or layout engine in modern thinking. But ligatures are really cool, so I decided to keep the FF and FI ones. The others could be used for more practical keys, though. In the end, I settled on this layout with the understanding that I would inevitably end up spending a lot of time hacking the code to add key combinations for other characters as I realized I just couldn't live without them. Now I needed the actual STL files of the 86 keycaps to be printed. I found some models for the 1x1 and 1x2 keycaps, and they were even in the DSA style that I admired. Opening them in Blender, I was able to duplicate and flip and merge them together to form the 2x2 and 2x3 caps I would also need. It took some experimentation, but I think the final results came out pretty good. Then it was just a process of bringing in the outline of every glyph, turning that into an extruded solid, and differencing out that shape from the front of each keycap. It was one of those annoying things that probably would have been faster to automate, but maybe not so you keep doing it, until you start to question yourself, but then sunk cost fallacy kicks in and you just keep doing it? Yeah, one of those. 86 times anything takes a long time. I ended up using my standard Courier New Bold for the glyphs, after trying a couple typewriter fonts and thinking they just didn't look as good. The FI ligature posed a bit of a problem. Courier does have an FF glyph, but not one for FI. So I got to design my own, which was pretty fun. With the keycaps coming along nicely, it was time to start assembly. The laser cut pieces had arrived and looked good. Smelled good, too. I cleaned them up at the shop, sanding everything to be smooth and even. The PCBs arrived, and I thought they looked pretty sweet. Please admire them now, because absolutely none of them will be visible in the final product. Soldering on all 144 diodes filled up a very pleasant evening. I solder SMD manually, first tinning the pads, and then going back with tweezers for each component. I then got the Teensy added on and started testing. The results at first were a bit chaotic, and I was worried I had messed up the PCB design. But after tweaking the matrix scanning code, I got it mostly working, except for two problems. Two of the rows weren't registering at all, despite having good continuity. And one of the columns would register a bunch of imaginary keystrokes whenever I touched any of its contacts. The first of these wasn't quite my fault. Turns out the footprint for the Teensy I was using had its pins in the wrong order, pushing two row lines onto non-IO pins. But I really should have noticed that. The other one turned out to be because I had put that column line onto the pin with the built-in LED on the Teensy. That one is definitely on me. The fixes were simple enough, just cutting the traces and soldering on jumpers, but still, blah. With all the keys registering properly, it wasn't hard to add a little lookup table for the different key codes into the program and have it start working as a USB keyboard. This meant I couldn't put off one of the last technical challenges any longer. How do you make a ligature key work on a USB keyboard? 
Those characters exist in Unicode, but keyboards don't use Unicode. They send key codes, and the OS has to decide what to do with them. I didn't particularly want to write a custom device driver for this thing, but luckily Windows offers a convenient workaround. Going way back to ye olde DOS days, you've been able to input arbitrary characters through the use of alt codes. Hold down alt, enter the code for the character you want on the keypad, yes, it has to be on the keypad, and release alt. Boom. I was able to use this to send 64256 and 64257, Unicode for the FF and FI glyphs. It has trouble in a lot of applications, which want to interpret these as emojis or other symbols, but at least it works in WordPad. To fully assemble the keyboard, I needed to carve out a little notch to make room for the Teensy, and cut openings for the USB cable to reach it. I could have included this last part in the laser cut design, but I wanted to see it all together first. All that was left was waiting for the keycaps, which needed one last processing step. The glyphs were pretty low contrast, being debossed into the surface. Real high quality keycaps are made double shot. That is, during injection molding, there is a second step injecting a different color of plastic to form the label. Cheaper ones just print on the surface, but that wears off faster. As a kid, I had once hand painted a keyboard inspired by hackers. Hide the planet! So I know all too well how quickly it gets grody. I wanted something more like double shot if possible. Sadly, multicolor resin printing isn't really a thing, so that wasn't an option. I found a video of someone doing exactly that with epoxy putty as a manual second shot process, and the results looked pretty good. So I tried it myself, and the results were pretty good. Doing it for all 86 keys took a while, but any process that I can do in the warmth of the kitchen, hanging out with the rest of the household, isn't really all that bad. The key to cleaning them off after the putty had been smeared in was to use some isopropyl alcohol on a paper towel. Your results might vary, though. The video I got the idea from had problems with the inlay shrinking as it cured, which I didn't see at all. All that was left was a quick sanding to smooth out the support bumps on the backs of the keys, and it was finally time for assembly. Any concerns I had about parts being too wobbly quickly disappeared as the stack-up grew. The case is held together with screw posts because I like the look of them. The screw heads are on the back side, so I didn't have to worry about getting them all lined up nicely. The keycaps went on fairly well, though I did have to clean some up with an X-Acto. They're definitely more fragile than real injection molded ones, so be a bit gentle with them. With that done, all that was left was final assembly and the keyboard was done. And what a lovely, ridiculous beast it is. It masses almost 2 kilograms, took about 2 months total to finish, and definitely cost far too much, but I'm not going to add it all up to find out. Since we want to be properly scientific, here is the control test of me typing on my normal keyboard first. I'm not a great typist, never having really learned touch typing properly, but I get the job done. And here I am doing the same test at the beginning of the week on the two-thirds keyboard. Yeah, back to Hunt and Peck. But I'd be just as bad on Dvorak. The real question is, what is it like after getting used to it? To give it a fair shake, I promised myself I would use it for a full week. The week was challenging. I spent less time on social media, which is probably for the best. But I did grow rather fond of the two-thirds. It has a lot of character, which I don't think I've ever said about a keyboard before. I even got to use the ligature keys a couple of times. It was really interesting, feeling deep down the truth of the character frequencies and just how much faster I learned the positions of the large keys. And treating upper and lower cases fundamentally distinct really made me question my typographic assumptions. The Latin alphabet, it turns out, has far, far more than just 26 letters. And for science, here's the same typing test, taking at the end of the week. So I got better, at least a bit. That's some actual touch typing there. As interesting as this has been though, I think I'm switching back to my Model M but maybe I'll finally give Dvorak a try. See you next time.